This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a woman and a policeman. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Bumbley Police Station. How can I help you? Yes, I need to report a stolen bag. Just a moment and I'll put you through to lost and stolen property. Hello, Sergeant Rhodes speaking. Can I help you? Yes, hello. I'd like to report a stolen bag. Hmm, OK, a stolen bag. Uh, we've been getting a lot of these lately. I'll need to get some details. Uh, let's see, uh, when was the last time you had your bag? Well, uh, about two hours ago. I just can't believe this has happened. I take it everywhere with me. It was given to me as a graduation present. I'm just so upset. Yes, I know. Uh, it's very frustrating. It seems like I put it down for a second and then it was gone. Yes. Look, the good news is that most of the stolen bags in our area are found, usually without the money. So I'd be surprised if you don't get it back later. Tell me, what does the bag look like? Well, it's dark blue, cylindrical. It has two carry handles either side of a zipper on top. Um, the zipper actually runs the length of the bag. It's a Vitoli bag. OK. Are there any other identifying marks on the bag? Things that would be unique to it. Um, name tags, scuff marks, that kind of thing. Well, not really. Um, there are a couple of scratches. In the top left corner on one side of the bag, near the handle, and I think another one in the opposite corner. OK. Uh, scratches on opposite corners. Now... Where were you when the bag went missing? Well, I remember the time. It was a quarter past twelve. Oh, no, actually, it was a bit after that, more like 12.25, because I was supposed to meet one of my friends for lunch at 12.30. Anyway, I was standing outside the supermarket when all of a sudden a group of teenagers came walking past. They must have been heading towards the cinema. They seemed to be in a hurry and probably late for the movie, so I stepped aside to let them by. When they'd passed by, I reached down to pick up my bag and it was gone. I see. Now, can you remember the contents of the bag? Yes. Um, let's see, my passport and some traveler's checks. Fortunately, I was carrying my camera and I had my wallet in my pocket. They're the main valuable things. Um... OK. Uh, anything else at all? Hmm, let's see. No, I think that was it. Oh, a few pens, but that's all really. As I say, nothing of real value. OK. I'm going to have to get your details. Are you here on holiday? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm visiting from Canada. I've been here for three weeks already, but I'll be here for another month. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now,、uh, have you contacted your credit card company? Yes, I did that immediately. They were very helpful. I still can't believe this could happen to me, and while I'm supposed to be enjoying myself on holiday. Yes, it's a real disappointment, whether you're on holiday or not. The thieves strike when you least expect it. Anyway, I need to take down your particulars.、Um, what's your name then? Yes,、uh, my name is Helen Reddy. That's R E A D Y. My address is well, the place where I'm staying here is the Palms, Unit fourteen, seventy-five Paradise Avenue. Okay, I may need your home address in Canada, but I'll get that more towards the time you're going to leave.、Uh, what about the telephone? What number will I be able to reach you on? Yes, it's four double five nine one double three two. Okay,、uh, four double five nine one double three two. And how much do you think the bag and contents are worth? Well, it's not really a big cost, probably only a hundred dollars. It's the inconvenience of it all. I understand. Look, we have a lot of lost or stolen property recovered daily. Come by the station tomorrow and have a look. As I said, there's a high chance that we'll get the bag back. Your passport, at the very least. Okay. Thanks for your help. See you tomorrow then. Bye. Yes. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You are going to listen to part of a radio interview about bottled water. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to sixteen. The day is coming, so my grandfather used to say, when people are going to pay for water. Well, that day has come. Bottled water. How did it come about? Why are people prepared to pay for something that, up until only recently, has been completely free? With me in the studio is Bill Gilroy, founder of UK Water Starters, who promises to shed some light on this topic. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, and hello, everyone. I dare say that not many of your listeners will be aware of this, but the bottled water market in the UK was actually first established a long time before your grandfather. In fact, it was established almost two centuries ago when the beneficial properties of mineral and spring water were recognised. The idea of bottled water meant that people would benefit from it without having to actually travel to the particular spring or well. We humans need water. The human body is actually two-thirds water. Yes, we're about sixty-six percent water, and that water must be continuously replaced. In fact, on average, we lose one third of a liter of water on a daily basis just through normal breathing. Nutritionists say we need to drink at least. Two liters of water a day. This need for water for the body ensures the bottled water industry 
will be around for a long time. Mm. Mm. Now, historically, the bottled water market gradually developed. It was well known in the early 19th century that bottled water was beneficial. But during the mid-19th century, the artificial mineral water market became a commercial viability for many entrepreneurs. Later on that century, this led to the emergence of the soft drink market as we know it today, which, of course, is a very large and sophisticated market. Underlying the move from the artificial mineral water to soft drinks was a fundamental change in the use of the product. Whilst in the early days mineral waters were drunk for their medicinal values, soft drinks are, of course, drunk primarily for their ability to refresh and to be enjoyed. As a result of this move, bottled mineral water, without any sweetening agents added, steadily became unfashionable and the market by the 1960s had declined to an almost non-existent level in the UK. The move during the 1960s, and to a lesser extent the 1970s, towards more processed foods impacted upon the bottled water market, and subsequently sales continued to decline. Of course, today in the 21st century, this is not the case. But interestingly, in the mid-1980s, an unexpected revolution moved the bottled water market forward with the introduction of a new recyclable plastic material that was used worldwide. This new, lighter, stronger material improved packaging and handling and was also visually appealing. It was during this time that bottled water sales began to improve. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, Bill, tell us what's led to the present-day popularity of bottled water. Well, as your listeners would know, bottled water in recent times has become very popular again. Some of the factors which have led to a resurgence of interest in bottled water are related to the growing use of wine alternatives with many main meals served in restaurants. There is a growing number of people who simply don't like wine. Instead, they prefer bottled waters in one form or another. Although Grandpa used to mutter <laughs> about people paying for water, price has never really played a part because people expect to pay a little extra when dining out. In addition, with air travel becoming less expensive, huge numbers of people started to travel abroad to places where bottled water was readily available and often considered the only safe water to drink. Of course, there are some few who bring their own water from home, but, as you know, water is extremely heavy to carry in large quantities. In the early days, the catering and restaurant markets used to be the main purchasers of bottled water. Before long, however, Supermarkets began to capitalise on in-home consumption and the UK bottlers began local manufacturing. The market today in total consumes in the region of 50 million litres which equates to about 30 million pounds sterling. Of course, part of this total goes through the catering markets. The take-home sector comprising both corner stores and the major supermarkets account for the other half. I'd now like to shift focus a little and briefly talk about... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3
You will hear two students, Brian and Emily, talking about penguins, the subject of their current assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 24. So, Brian, how have you been doing with your reading on penguins? Not too bad, Emily. And you? Yeah, OK. I hadn't realised there were so many differences between the various types of penguin. No, nor had I. Anyway, I started with the Gen 2. And me with the rock hopper. And it turns out they're rather cautious. <laughs> Not scared of swimming, I trust. <laughs> oh, no. But they don't like going about at night. Scared of the dark, I suppose. And if they're climbing over some rocky landscape, they'll only jump if they have to. And even then, they'll look carefully down and spend time deciding whether to or not. Is that common? I don't think so. The rock hopper will have a quick look if it's somewhere they haven't dropped down before. But they don't seem timid. In fact, they're pretty determined. And if they're trying to get up somewhere, they grip onto the stones with their slightly hooked bills, as well as their nails when the surface gets very steep. Nothing stops them. Interesting. Because the other type I looked into, the Magellanic, tend to stick to the beach rather than going inland. So you see them walking along with their flippers at their sides or a bit forward. If they come across something they haven't seen before... They cock their head first to one side, then the other, peering out of each eye in turn, as if they don't quite believe anything until they've double-checked it. And then, when they call to each other about anything, they arch their backs strangely first, before making a very loud noise indeed. Oh, because the king penguin stands very upright when it calls. And they have the longest flippers, which they hold towards the ground, as if they're worried about falling over. But it's quite dignified too. I think they're my favourite type. Uh-huh. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 25 to 30. Anyway, there are some things that they all do the same, aren't there? Oh, yes. Eating fish, for example. Well, of course. <laughs> but sleeping, say? Yes. Occasionally you might see one stretched out flat in the sun for a snooze. But normally you see them standing at night, even though they're sound asleep. It seems odd, doesn't it? And then they're all liable to get aggressive if they feel invaded, aren't they? Yeah, not quite so sweet then. <laughs> and with the rock hopper... The one with the distinctive black and yellow feathers on its head. That's the one. If it gets annoyed about something, then the black feathers on the head point upwards and the yellow feathers stick out. It all makes it look bigger or tougher. I wonder how often they get annoyed. Well, I don't know about annoyed, but they've plenty to get frightened of. They've got predators in the water and on land, well, in the sky anyway. Oh, yes, the great skewer bird. It's after the eggs. So the penguins have to keep a careful watch for the skewer all the time, especially when they're nesting. They can spot the white patches in its wings, can't they, as one flies over? Yes, and then they sit very closely on the eggs to protect them. Not an easy life, really. No. So what else have we found out? Well, I was interested to see that although they nest individually, they always go into the sea together, in large numbers. Even though it might make them more obvious to predators. That's the price to pay for the best way to find food. It means a bigger catch from each trip. I see. I watched a video too, just showing them on the beach, and I was struck by how calm they seemed to be. I thought they might have looked frightened. Perhaps it's because there are so many of them. Maybe that gives them a sense of security. 
In fact, all the types have a social nature.、Mm. I guess that's why we humans find them so fascinating to observe. I guess so. So, shall we start to put all our notes together,、mm. and then I think you'll. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about issues involved in the management of the growth of cities. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now, a key issue in the ability of cities to grow is the question of housing. However, quality is as important as quantity here, but that isn't to say that this is easy to guarantee, and the development, or at least the spread, of many modern cities is marked by the sprawl of slum or shantytown housing. Governments are, of course, keen to address this, but the tendency to demolish them has often proved disastrous, as it doesn't solve the problem unless satisfactory replacements are ready for the inhabitants. What I'm saying is that suitable housing projects have to be lined up to accommodate these otherwise displaced people, and suitable is the key word here. All too frequently, there isn't real consultation, only token gestures. If the residents aren't fully involved, they are unlikely to find the resulting development appropriate to their needs. People need to feel reasonably independent, and strategies for providing accommodation schemes work much better if an approach rooted in self-help is applied. People value things more when they have been part of bringing them into being. At the same time. Residents can't do everything for themselves, or not well enough anyway, and so governments need to accept that a number of services will always have to be laid on. These would include electricity and water, and so on. From the other side, residents need to feel able to commit. Migrants are essential to the growth of cities, bringing rapid increases in population, skills, and income. But they need to have a sense of security. Of long-term commitment to the city, if they are to invest money in building or buying houses, developing this sense of commitment isn't straightforward, and it takes time. It's complex and involves several factors. People need to feel they belong, and unfortunately, too many governments fail to appreciate that community values are a crucial component of that. Sadly, there are too many housing schemes which don't work. People drift away, or the whole place becomes crime-ridden. It's easy to be wise after the event, but it is worrying that a lot of housing is put up without analysis having been carried out to examine how much employment is going to be available for people. But I don't want to labour the negatives too hard. Such difficulties as there are are challenges, and challenges that can be and often are overcome. And cities are, I believe, a good thing.
Urbanization, the process of developing cities and the societies that comprise them, may not be everyone's dream, but it has a huge impact on the economy and also benefits each and every person's freedom. Furthermore, the sheer volume of people means that work can be differently distributed. In villages, people need to be multi-skilled in order to be autonomous, but in cities, you can see the evolution of a variety of specialist activities, and this means people live in a more sophisticated way. It's not only tangible phenomena. There are all sorts of other equally important benefits too. Residing in cities brings us face to face with many different ways of thinking or going about things, and this increases our degree of understanding, something which is hard to measure in scientific terms, but which surely makes better people of us all. Right, well, now I'd like to turn our attention to the suburbs. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.